Okay. Hello, everybody um, in the Zoom space and in person. Um, welcome to this lecture. Uh, my name is Lizzie Meister. I'm the public programs manager here at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. And I'm really excited to get to welcome Stephanie Deutsch here to share about her book, You Need a Schoolhouse Julius Rosen and Julius Rosenwald um, in just a few moments. Um, this event is part of an ongoing series centered around our current special exhibition, A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 schools that changed America. Um, the museum is grateful to Bill and Susan Hess, to Con the Kahn Family Foundation, for the, and the Kahn Family Foundation for their support of this special exhibition. Um, and then the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities is a media partner. Uh, for our virtual participants, um, we will have a question and answer opportunity at the end. And so you're welcome to pop your questions in the chat and we will read them aloud here in person. Folks in person, you get the benefit of voicing your uh, questions um, and there will be an opportunity at the end. Um, following our conversation, there's an opportunity to buy You Need a Schoolhouse and Stephanie's offer to sign the books. Um, and you can buy that in our museum store. If you're online, we have an online museum store, don't worry, and I will drop that uh, link in the chat so that you can buy this wonderful book and have it at your own home. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Stephanie. Stephanie Deutsch is a writer who lives in Washington, D.C. Her father was in the Foreign Service, so she grew up all over in New Zealand, France, and Arlington, Virginia. After raising her three children, she turned her attention to writing, where she became absorbed by the Julius Rosenwald story. Stephanie's children are now grown, and she is the happy and proud grandmother of eight grandchildren. Um, I would like to welcome Stephanie Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it is great to be here, and um, what a beautiful museum. I just, I came early, so I had chance a chance to see the video and, and uh, look at the exhibits. And I just was so impressed. It's wonderful. Um, so I'm sure you all have heard the saying that in the 19th century, when Jews were peddlers, as so many were, they traveled far and wide throughout the South. And then they ended up settling in whatever town they were in when the horse died, right? Um, well, that actually has nothing to do with Julius Rosenwald, although his father, did start his life in America as a peddler. He peddled, he arrived in Baltimore and peddled on the Winchester Trail in Virginia. Um, but Julius did not grow up in the South. He was born in Springfield, Illinois and grew up, spent his adult life in Chicago. So how is it that this man came to have such an important role in the lives of hundreds of thousands of African-Americans in the South? And I think you could say, an impact that is still being said today. So who was Julius Rosenwald? How and why did he become so interested in the lives of Southern men and women and in the first few generations after emancipation and more generally in the well-being of America's black population? I think most of you've seen the wonderful photos upstairs by Andrew Filer, so you know a bit of this story. Um, Julius Rosenwald's parents came from Northern Germany and they came for the reasons that are of course familiar to all of you. They came seeking opportunity. They came seeking freedom from the laws and prejudices that restricted life for Jews in Europe. Julius's mother came first, Augusta Hammerslow. She arrived in Baltimore where her brothers were successfully running a clothing business. And so when Samuel Rosenwald arrived a few years later, he got employment with the Hammerslows, started as a peddler, ended up falling in love with their sister, marrying Augusta, and uh, the brothers gave the young married couple uh, the chance to become managers of a store they had established in Springfield, Illinois. So Julius Rosenwald was born in Springfield. Ooh, let's see, where's my, here it is. Um, whoop. Okay, I'll let you fiddle with that. Um, Julius was born in Springfield in 1862. Uh, and so here he is as a young man. Uh, 
And this is the house he grew up in. Uh, so he grew up sort of middle class. This house is right across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. Obviously, when Julius was a child, the Lincolns weren't there. But Abraham Lincoln had frequented his uncle's store. And uh, one of his uncles, in fact, traveled to Washington to be part of the official delegation that brought Lincoln's body back uh, for burial in Springfield. Um, this house uh, actually is owned by the National Park Service. And I'll talk more later about the campaign to create a Julius Rosenwald National Historical Site, but this will um, be part of it when that, when that happens. Um, so Julius grew up in a, um, there was a small community, Jewish community in Springfield. His father at one time was president of the temple. He studied for a bar mitzvah and he was confirmed, worked in his father's store on weekends, did well in school, but didn't graduate from high school because when he was 16, and I don't know whether this was his idea or his parents' idea or an idea that they shared, uh, he left Springfield and went to New York where he was um, apprenticed to his uncles. They had moved, they had moved from retail clothing to manufacturing. And they were now manufacturing clothing in the wholesale, the rag trade in New York. Um, so Julius went there, lived for a time with one of his uncles, and then moved to a boarding house on the Lower East Side, where he made a couple of interesting friends. <clears throat> one was Henry Goldman, who would go on to become part of Goldman Sachs. Another was um, <clears throat> Henry Morgenthau, later a diplomat and a scion of a famous family. And as I learned this morning at the World War II Museum, it was Henry Morgenthau Jr., who had the idea of creating war bonds to help finance um, the, the war effort. Um, so clothing manufacturing is a hugely successful business. Julius and his younger brother, Morris, decide to open their own uh, company to manufacture men's clothing. And they think they'll do it in Chicago so they won't be in direct competition with their, with their uncles. So they move to Chicago, they start a business, and in 1895, Julius had a life-changing opportunity. Through a relative, he was offered the chance to buy into a small, unknown mail order company called Sears Roebuck. And uh, Sears had started as a company to sell watches. And Richard Sears, the man who, who started it, found the response was so good that he found he could sell just about anything by mail. At this time, there was a large rural population. People didn't have access to easy access to stores in a lot of places. And so Sears was a business that Julius later wrote, it took him about five minutes to decide, yeah, this is a business with a future. And um, he had, it. Julius brought an amazing trait to Sears Roebuck, which was that Sears was a great promoter and he was great at advertising. And one of his colleagues later said, oh, he could sell a breath of air. But the managerial side, the making the orders, getting the orders delivered on time, that he wasn't so strong at. Well, Julius was an excellent manager. And so he brought that, he brought that managerial side and Sears did really, really well. And in uh, 1905, they decided that they needed a larger plant to do their business. Um, and so they designed uh, a new, home for Sears on the west side of Chicago. Julius was in charge of the building project. And <clears throat> towards the end, like many building uh, enterprises, it was more expensive than had been anticipated. And so Julius approached his old pal, Harry Goldman, uh, for a loan. And Goldman said, instead of a loan, how about we sell shares? And uh, this was the second uh, IPO in American business history and was wildly successful. Um, the, the result was this beautiful plant on Chicago's west side. But the other result was that Richard Sears and Julius Rosenwald became very, very wealthy, um, very beyond their wildest dreams. Um, uh, so as a newly wealthy person, Julius did a lot of the things that any of us would do. He bought a big house. He had a wife and five children. Um, and the two boys, Lessing and the little boy with the funny shoes, that's William, his youngest child, and then the three girls, Marion, Marion Edith, Adele, Adele, Edith, I get mixed up because they looked a lot alike. Uh, um, 
but he also took the family on a trip to Germany. Um, I love this picture because gosh, just as a fashion statement, it's a little weird, but, um, but it also is significant because Julius maintained close connections with those with the family back in Germany. And this would play out uh, in the 1930s after Julius had died, Lessing and Bill orchestrated the rescue from, from Germany of 350 family members and some other people closely associated with them. Um, so this was this was this is Julius in the middle. That's Gussie um, on the left and the, the kids in in front, the Lessing on the on the right. But he also, of course, as a newly wealthy man, was thinking about Sadaka. He was thinking about using his money uh, to benefit others. Um, he was an active member of the Sinai congregation, which was led by Emil Hirsch, a very dynamic rabbi who preached what I call a version of the social gospel, that, that if you have money, you use it uh, not on, not on uh, vanity projects. You use it to benefit society. You use it to benefit people in need. Uh, and Julius was very, he always cited um, Rabbi Hirsch as one of his mentors. So about this time, two things bring Julius's attention to African-Americans. One was, you all probably know this, in 1908, there was a huge race riot in Springfield, Illinois, his hometown. He wasn't there at the time, but it was on the front page of the Chicago papers for three days. And Julius, at this time, yeah. like many American Jews, he'd been uh, giving money to support victims of pogroms. And he began to think that what Jews were suffering in Europe, there was some similarity to what was happening to um, African-Americans. Um, he said in a speech, we look down on the Russians for the way they treat their Jews, but what we're doing in this country to Negroes uh, is much the same thing. And that really made an impression on him. Similarly, about this time, um, one of his friends, Mr. Sachs, I'm blanking on his first name, Paul. Paul Sachs gave him a copy of Up From Slavery, uh, which was of course Booker T. Washington's autobiography. Um, and he was very impressed by this. And one of the things I find interesting about Julius is this wasn't a sentimental attachment. This was very practical. One of the things he felt was our country can't thrive if we have a significant portion of our population that's deliberately left behind. That won't work. Um, and of course, he was very right about that. About this time, he was asked to donate to a YMCA building in Chicago. And he said, well, I'll let my Christian brothers build a YMCA building. But if you decide to build a Y for African-Americans, come back and talk to me. Um, the Y at that time, you know, was a place where people could stay. It was a place that offered social opportunities at a time when blacks couldn't stay and there were no hotels, there weren't places they could stay. This is the great migration is happening. People are coming up. So Y's were a very significant thing. The, the people from the Y came back to him and they said, uh, would you be willing to donate for a, a YMCA for black people? He said, yes. As a matter of fact, I'll give $25,000 to any city in America that can raise $75,000 for a black YMCA. Ultimately, 27 cities uh, took him up on that. And uh, one of the YMCAs was in Atlanta, one was in um, Los Angeles. Um, so that was his toe in the water, if you will. Um, in 1911, the next year, he had the chance to meet Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was, of course, <clears throat> the most, by far the most well-known, widely respected African-American of his day. Um, he had been born in uh, 1856 in the western part of Virginia. Um, he, interestingly, he grew up on a family farm. You know, we think of plantations. I mean, Louisiana was full of plantations, but Booker grew up on a family farm. There was just one family there, his, and the family that enslaved them, and then his mother, his sister, his brother, very, very small. Um, he managed through various means to get himself to Hampton Institute, which had been founded by the Freedmen's Bureau after the war to create 
teachers, because of course this was a tremendous need in the black community. Um, he walked part of the way, he talks about this in Up From Slavery, he walked part of the way from Western Virginia to Hampton, which is in Tidewater. And um, uh, he tells in Up From Slavery about how his entrance exam was being asked to clean a dirty classroom, which thanks to a job he had had uh, back in where he had lived, uh, he was able to do very well. People came to Hampton with very different degrees of education, mostly not much, because this is shortly after emancipation. Um, Booker did well. He um, was the graduation speaker when he graduated. And I love this picture. When I, when I speak to, to um, kids, I always say, what do you see there? Um, and they say, well, he looks proud or he looks excited. And I always say, don't you think he also looks a bit anxious? I, I see a great deal of anxiety. He, you know, what, what lies ahead for a really smart African-American in 1875? Um, well, what lay ahead for him was he taught for a few years and then the state of Alabama decided to set up a school kind of like Hampton and the, the, um, from Alabama, they wrote to the principal of Hampton, a white man, and they said, could you recommend a white man to come down to Alabama and start this school? And he wrote back and said, I am sending you Booker T. Washington. No white man could do better. Um, so Booker went down to, it, 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 as age 25, he goes down to rural Alabama and he sets up Tuskegee Institute. And it is a school to educate people to be teachers. Um, people were admitted, like at Hampton, they came from all variety of backgrounds, many of them not knowing much. Um, they, they learned um, intellectual skills and a classical curriculum, but they also learned trades. Uh, the campus was built by the students. Uh, has anyone here been to Tuskegee? Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful campus. Uh, the students made the bricks. They built the buildings, uh, they studied architecture, they studied uh, carpentry. Um, they were also cooking and laundry. Um, so by the turn of the century, Tuskegee was a thriving um, establishment. Um, in 1895, I sort of love the parallelism that it's the same year that Rosenwald had his big chance with Sears. Um, Booker T. Washington was invited to give a short speech at the Atlanta and Cotton States exhibition, kind of like a World's Fair. Um, later, Booker uh, W.B. Du Bois called this speech the Atlanta Compromise because in the speech, Washington said, addressing an entirely white audience, in things that are purely social, we can be separate as the fingers, but in things Create, devoted to economic progress and the welfare of our beloved Southland will be one as a fist or one as a hand. Um, in the immediate, the reaction to the speech was incredibly positive. Even uh, W.B. Du Bois wrote him a letter congratulating him on it. Um, and and uh, Frederick Douglass had died a couple months before the speech. And so Washington got letters from people saying, you're our Douglass now. And he really emerged as a, a very significant um, person. His success was against the backdrop of really deteriorating conditions for African-Americans. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson establishes, which happened right here, uh, based on something that happened right here, establishes separate but equal uh, as the law of the land. The states start rewriting their constitutions uh, blacks had been voting in a lot of places since emancipation. States start to pull, you know, restrict it, make it harder. And then lynching. Um, when I started this research, I thought, oh yeah, I, I know about lynching. It happened occasionally. A mm, hundred documented lynchings a, a year between 1890 and about 1930. Uh, some of you probably visited in Montgomery, the new, um, the, Brian Stevenson Memorial. Um, so it was a very challenging time. Um, so Booker T. Washington comes to Chicago in 1911. Julius is anxious to meet him. They're anxious to meet each other. Julius gives a luncheon for him at the Blackstone Hotel, which has never had a African-American visitor before. And then the day after the lunch, uh, Julius invites him out to Sears and shows him all around. 
And um, the two men hit it off. And I can almost remember the point in my research when I started to think about this and think, gosh, it's so interesting. They were very different, different backgrounds. But I think one thing that attracted them to each other was they were both practical. They were problem solvers. They weren't philosophers. They didn't want to sit around and talk about ideas. They, they were interested in getting things done. So one of the things that Booker wanted to do was get Julius on the board of Tuskegee. So Julius, being the practical man he was, said, well, I can't join the board of Tuskegee if I haven't visited. So in the fall of 1911, he hires a private railroad car, fills it with um, his family, Lessing, his son came, his brother Morris came, Rabbi Hirsch came, his friend Jane Adams, who was a good friend, remember all Hull House, Jane Adams came. They come down to Tuskegee and they spend three days there. Um, this is a picture of them on the campus, not from that initial visit, but um, but I love that picture. That's the only, these are the only two pictures I know of the two of them together, but um, I, I really love those pictures. Uh, the last night of the visit, uh, they have a service in Tuskegee's chapel. This was, sadly, this building is no longer standing. They have a modern chapel there now, but they had a service in the chapel where they, the students sang spirituals this had been made popular at, at um, uh, Fisk. The Jubilee singers had, had made a thing about singing spirituals. And remember, this is before records, before radio, that they had never heard this music before. And Julius was really engaged. And um, shortly after that, he invited Booker T. Washington to Chicago. And one of the very exciting moments in my research was I interviewed Julius's youngest child, Bill, um, who was then over 90, uh, and he invited me to his apartment in New York, and um, we talked about various things, and one of the things he said was that he remembered when Booker T. Washington came to their house in Chicago, and I said, gosh, well, Bill William would have been about nine at the time. I said, what was that like? And he said, well, I don't know. I didn't really think much about Booker T. Washington. I didn't know anything about him, but I wondered why he and my father spent such a long time in my father's office with the door closed. And I speculate that they were talking. And one of the things they were talking about was Booker explaining to Julius that the prevailing hunger among black people in the South was education for their children. This was something they'd been deprived all through slavery. Remember, it was illegal to teach a slave to read in most places. This was what they want. And um, so uh, for his 50th birthday in, um, 1912, Julius made many generous uh, charitable gifts. And one of them was $25,000 to Tuskegee where he just joined the board. Booker T. Washington said, how about if we take 2,500, a small portion of that and use it to do matching grants with six communities right around Tuskegee to build schools. And Julius agreed. And um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is one of those first schools called Chihaw. Um, the community raised $300 and Julius gave $300 to build the school. Now the community is sharecroppers. It's people who have, you know, these are not wealthy people, but they were absolutely committed to obtaining schools. And so they did. Mm -hmm. um, this is also a picture of one of the early schools. And I love this because it shows the whole community turned out. This may have been taken on the occasion when Julius came to visit the schools. And one of the things that impressed him so was he didn't just see children, he saw the whole community because it was of importance to everyone. So those first schools, those first schools built around Tuskegee led to a program which over the next 20 years collaborates with communities in 5,000, with 5,000 communities. Um, this is familiar, I think it's in Andrew's show, um, but it's just such a remarkable map. Each one of those communities raised money. Here's another amazing fact. Dollar for dollar, the black people in those communities contributed more to the schools than Julius Rosenwald. The other stroke of brilliance was these schools were built and then given to the social, to the, the, the first schools, given to the public school system, which had not been providing adequately. Um, so that as the program went on, the public school systems became by far the largest donors. They financed the schools 
with significant help from Rosenwald and from, uh, from the local people. And for people who, because of segregation, they couldn't use the public library. They couldn't use the public playground. These schools became just a vital center, a community center. Um, there was one alumni who said, it was where everything happened. And everything was not just reading and writing. Here's some more schools. I love this picture. Do you notice the little spelling error in the name of the school? Most of the schools, I should say, were not called Rosenwald. They had their own names. The community that built the school chose the name. And many, many people who went to Rosenwald schools, who went to what we now call Rosenwald schools, never heard the name Rosenwald. They, Rosenwald schools was a, a sort of shorthand that was used um, in the program, but the schools all had, a lot of them had biblical names like Shiloh, Gethsemane, uh, Jerusalem, and a lot of them had names of people who had donated money. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, that's a school in Texas called the Friendship School. Um, lots of the schools now have vanished. Um, when segregation ended, the schools closed. Um, but in many, many places, people have worked to preserve the schools. Um, everything that happened in the schools was not just reading and writing and arithmetic, although, of course, those things were taught by legions of devoted Rosenwald school teachers. But everything included self-confidence, community building, and a sense of citizenship. And this came into play in the 1950s as the movement to assure civil rights for every American gained strength. This reminds me of one of my favorite moments in visiting Rosenwald schools. I've been to two different schools where alumni told me that one of their requirements when, when they attended the school was that every student had to learn to recite the Gettysburg Address. And I should have included a picture of Newell Quinton who went to a school on the Eastern shore of Maryland and he stood on the little stage in the school and recited the Gettysburg Address um, for a group that was visiting. Um, so I had a sort of aha moment when I was watching the documentary that many of you have probably seen, The Eyes on the Prize. And there's video of people walking to work in Montgomery, Alabama, which they did for a year during the Montgomery bus boycott. And I thought, wow, some of these people probably went to Rosenwald schools, or if they didn't, their aunts, their uncles, they knew someone who did. Um, it was, it was, um, there were so many of them and uh, it was so impactful. Um, you probably know John Lewis went to a Rosenwald school in Alabama. Maya Angelou, if you've seen the documentary, there's wonderful, or if you're going to see the documentary, wonderful footage of her talking about her school. Uh, singer Nina Simone, NAACP chairman Victor Dahmer. There's a wonderful photo in um, Andrew's show of his widow. Um, so today, alumni of Rosenwald schools are again joining forces, just the way their forebears did to get the schools. They want to preserve the schools and preserve uh, the story of how they got built. Um, and there's so much affection and pride in the schools. This is actually the first Rosenwald school I ever visited. This is in Rappahannock County, um, Virginia, the Scrabble School. and. Um, this was when the, the school was um, refurbished and rededicated. And those signs say, this place matters, which was a saying that the National Trust used. Um, th that's a group of alumni at a school in um, Goochland County, Virginia. The man in the middle, Calvin Hopkins, said uh, at one of the events I went to there, he said, the things I learned in this room were directly responsible for me taking and doing well on the Air Force entrance exam. And I joined the Air Force and had a fabulous 25 year com uh, career there. Um, and these people come back regularly for uh, programs. This is the Ridgely Rosenwald School, just 20 minutes from my home on Capitol Hill in DC. It's in Maryland and uh, it's beautifully restored. And these women are members of the Delta sorority and they support the school and the woman in the red hat there, her grandmother, Mary Eliza Ridgely, gave the land the school stands on. She returned, she went to the school when she was in first grade. She returned to the school as a teacher, later as a principal, 
And that's her daughter, Laverne, uh, in the white jacket, who also went to the school. And uh, they're a wonderful presence. Uh, I just did a Zoom um, Black History Month presentation for them. Um, these women, uh, they are all part of uh, the Pleasant Hill School in Linden, Texas. Um, this woman, sadly, she has now died. She taught there for 40 years. And they get together once a week to um, make quilts. Um, I have one of the quilts they made. It was, it was uh, auctioned at a Rosenwald conference in Tuskegee, and I won the auction. Um, uh, and they have a program that they do for schools where they talk about the Underground Railroad. Um, I just like that picture. Um, that's in North Carolina. North Carolina had the most uh, Rosenwald schools. They had 800, um, but Louisiana had 400. Um, I mean, it's a lot. Uh, and I was able to go out yesterday to Donaldsonville where there's a beautiful Rosenwald school and a um, small museum. But I should also say to you that you in New Orleans have a particular relationship to this story. You probably know this. Julius Rosenwald's middle child, Edith, married Edgar Stern, um, the first Jew to trade on the cotton exchange, I believe. They were very important in the civic life of New Orleans. Um, her home, Longview, is now a treasured museum and public garden. And um, her grandson, Bill Hess, and his wife, Susan, are with us and um, carrying on the family tradition. So when the, when the Julius Rosenwald um, hired Edwin Embry in 1928 to run the Rosenwald Fund, he was getting old, he was getting ready to, to, he was retired from Sears. And so Edwin Embry ran the Rosenwald Fund for the last 20 years. Um, and when he wrote the story of the fund, he called it investment in people. And I just think that's a brilliant name because what is education if not an investment in people? It's an investment in children, it's an investment in the future. Um, through, the, through the schools and through his partnership with Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald invested in children. There also was a program that came after the school program that was largely associated with Embry of fellowships. Um, 900 fellowships, most of them went to African Americans, and they went to an astonishing array of scholars, uh, artists, and intellectuals. Um, and it, it was kind of like a, a who's who of Black accomplishment. And just in finishing, I'll tell you one aspect of the Rosenwald Fund. Ten fellows recognized by the Rosenwald Fund with financial grants participated in the legal briefs that led to the Supreme Court decision, the legal briefs that Thurgood Marshall used in presenting the case Brown versus Board of Education that led to the taking down of um, separate but equal. 10 Rosenwald fellows participated in pre preparing that. One was lawyer Robert Carter. One was education expert Horace Mann Bond, the father of Julian Bond. And psychologists Mamie Phipps Clark and Kenneth Clark were famous for the doll experiment which showed how the self-esteem of African-American children was being eroded by the effects of segregation and second-class status. And this is a picture showing that experiment and it was taken by photographer Golden, Gordon Parks, who was also a Rosenwald fellow. Rosenwald's philanthropy really is a remarkable example of giving in the spirit of tzedakah. It strengthened and empowered the recipients and the return on Julius's investment in people is a stronger, more cohesive, more optimistic society. Julius Rosenwald is not well remembered today. One reason is that he did not believe in perpetual endowments. He never donated to endowment funds. He felt that every generation will create wealth and that that generation will understand the needs of the community it faces and will be able to meet those needs with its own philanthropy. So he designed his fund to put itself out of business within 25 years of his death, which it did in 1948. So there is no longer a Julius Rosenwald Fund. You know, there will be a Rockefeller Foundation until the end of time. But, um, but there is now a campaign to create a Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historical Site, uh, and it's gaining steam. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some 
important developments this year um, relating to that. And um, if you want more information on that, there's a website which we can give you. And uh, the campaign puts out a newsletter and, and various other things. And with that, I'd like to see if anyone has any questions or um, any any aspect of this you'd like to talk about some more. We'll open it up to people in the room and then on Zoom, we'll, uh, we'll ask people online. So I saw this hand here. Um, how long have you been working uh, on the research? When did you begin? It took me a long time. Um, and I'll, it, it probably took me 10 years to do the research. And I'll tell you one thing that slowed me down was I was truly shocked at the extent of my own ignorance. Um, I shared with Lizzie that I, um, in college, I studied Russian studies. And, you know, that was in the 60s, that seemed kind of a cool thing to do. I don't know. Um, but I, uh, American history had gotten a little slighted. Uh, I went to a French high school. Um, and as I, as I started to learn this, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I certainly knew the name Booker T. Washington. I had no idea really about him. So I had a lot to learn. Um, and, uh, I, so it took a while and I was still, I was doing the research at the time I was getting my kids into college and it was, you know, it was a hectic time. Uh, but, um, so probably about 10 years. How did you get interested? Oh, <laughs> well, through a family connection. I So my husband, David, is a great grandson of Julius Rosenwald. He's a cousin of Bill Hess. Um, and interestingly, he grew up not knowing anything. I mean, he knew the name Julius Rosenwald, but he really knew very little about him. But I was interested in writing a biography. And another Rosenwald cousin, Betsy, I don't know if you know Betsy Kleeblatt, but she lives in D.C. And she said, well, what about Julius Rosenwald? And I said, oh, I don't know, I'm a businessman. I'm not sure I'm interested in that. But when I started to do the research um, and discovered uh, the schools, I was very interested. And it was just the time in 2002, the National Trust for Historic Preservation named the Rosenwald schools to their list of most endangered historic sites in America. So that attracted a lot of attention. So that's that was when I was doing my research and um, a cousin of, my husband and and uh, Bill Hess, uh, uh, Peter Askely was working on his biography then, and he helped me a lot and, um, you know, pointed me towards different sources. But that, but it was a family thing. We have some questions in the chat that will. Okay, and there's that. one in the back of the room. Uh, oh. Can you, can you give us a, in your ten years of research uh, maybe a, an example of a setback? I'm sure it wasn't all smooth sailing uh, to create thousands of schools. Um, I mean, this you mean a setback for Rosenwald or a setback for me? Mm -hmm. uh, for, for the Rosenwald, uh, what you document, you know, besides burning of the school, was there anything like There were some, hundreds? yeah, there were some schools burned. Um, uh, and there's a wonderful description. Um, there's a book about Arkansas something of the Delta, the empire of the Delta, I think it's called. And it talks about how there was a county that was gonna build some Rosenwald schools and there was they were aware of a lot of hostility. And so they went to great lengths to have everything ready so that they could in a period of about a week put up six schools. Um, so there was, there was that, but other than that, no, I'm not aware of, of major setbacks for, maybe you are. Which stories have we had with the money came to the money came to the community, but somehow the parish went, Ooh. and the school didn't get built. Ugh. The firm came in and pulled the money back out. Wow! They paid, they paid close attention. Yeah. Well, yes, they did pay very, very close attention. I mean, that that management skill that Julius that was very much in evidence in the program, and um, that was his that was his strong suit. And, um, but no, uh, I, I'm not aware of, um, the burning of course was significant. Um, a question from online. Do we know if there were any problems with many local school boards, likely all white, rejecting the grants and causing possible schools to never, never be funded or built? 
I don't know. I suspect that probably did happen. And there's, there's uh, many subjects for future scholars to dig deeper into this story. There's lots of records about all this. Um, the records of the Rosenwald Fund are at Fisk University in Nashville. And um, they are in the process of digitizing all those records. So um, go at it. Find out more. <laughs> Dumb question, but um, there are no dumb questions. <laughs> I'm wondering, there seems to be like a little bit of a paradox that these schools were terrific and like brilliant people came out of them. And the very people who were at these schools and so grateful for their black only schools argued against having black only schools in the Supreme Court. Was that because um, the percentage? of schools that African-Americans went to that were Rosenwald schools was actually very small. So they felt like we went to the good ones, but we see the vast majority of our people are in this separate, but allegedly equal, which is not equal situation, getting the short shrift or like, what was their thinking? They were so proud of the education they got. Why would they argue against segregated schools? Well, you're raising a really interesting and difficult topic. First of all, Rosenwald schools educated about a third of the African-American children in the South through the 20s, 30s, 40s. So there are lots of people who weren't going to Rosenwald schools. But the push to expand educational opportunities for African-Americans was ongoing. And Brown versus Board of Education was the culmination of many, many suits that were put up in many, many places, um, suits there were in Maryland near where I live, there were suits to try and make teachers that black, the pay of black teachers equal to the pay of white teachers. Um, the, the, the Bob Stanton, one of the people who's involved in the campaign to create the Rosenwald Park, uh, Bob grew up in East Texas. Uh, he did not go to a Rosenwald school, but his parents were involved in a suit uh, where they were arguing that they wanted their children to be able to go to the best school in town, which might or might not have been the black school. They were, didn't perceive it as the black school. This was happening all over. There's a wonderful book called A Girl Stands in the Door about early civil rights suits. And it caught my attention because the first, the first um, case it talks about uh, was from a segregated high school right near where I live in Washington, DC. It's now of course, a, you know, not segregated. But a child in that school wanted to go to what she saw as a better school that was a white school. So this was a push that was coming up from many, many, many places. Um, and one of the things that was really hard for me when I was doing my research, I mean, I can almost remember the exact moment that it occurred to me that there was loss for the African-American community as well as gain with the end of segregation because Rosenwald schools all had black principals, all had black teachers. The, the environment was incredibly supportive and warm and well, okay, you take that away. Everyone goes to a white school. For some kids, it was okay, you know, it worked out okay. But many of those black principals weren't gonna end up the black principal of a formerly white high school. So there was loss, there was loss as well as gain. Obviously we had to get rid of, of segregation. I mean, obviously that couldn't endure, but I think one of the things that has been underappreciated is the incredible resilience and energy that black people showed in building up institutions. Um, you know, the expression, making a way out of no way. That's what they did. That's what they did. And um, it's, it's an inspiring story. Um, and it's still playing out. We're still we're still trying to make it good for everyone. Question from online: Where does the title of the book "You Need a Schoolhouse" come from? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I was just asked that question down in Mobile, Alabama. Um, it's from a speech uh, by Booker T. Washington. Um, prior to the schoolhouses, um, people were being kids were being educated uh, in people's homes. They were being educated in church buildings uh, or in shacks. Um, and Booker T. Washington felt you need a schoolhouse, that the modern schoolhouse represents something in the community, something you can look at and see 
this is a beautiful building. This is a modern building. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me was that early on when they were discussing the, the architecture of the buildings, um, it was strongly felt that a lot of schools had had little church, church like cupolas on top and they wanted to do away with that. This isn't a church, this is a school. And so Booker T. Washington said, you need a schoolhouse. Um, so that was where I got the title. Many more questions online as well. So fair <laughs> with the other. Um, could you talk more about the German family that was saved by the Rosenwalds? Yes. Um, this is a very interesting story. Um, when uh, I, I can't give you the details about how it happened, but I can tell you some of the fallout. When Peter Askeley's book came out in whatever year it was, 2010 or something, Peter had a big family reunion in uh, Chicago. Were you there? Bill. Um, well, they had color coded name tags so you could see which Rosenwald child people were descended from. And then there were people and their name tag said German family. And they were the descendants. They were related to people who had been brought over. And um, all those all those people that you saw in the picture of the German family, well, you know, they had stayed in Bunda. They were quite well to do. And um, uh, so it was Bill and, and Lessing who put together the program. They hired social workers, they hired lawyers, um, and they, they not only brought over members of their family, but um, I met a woman in, um, in Richmond uh, who had come over as a child, and she said that her aunt worked for Bill Rosenwald. And uh, her aunt is helping Bill put together this program. And she said, you know, I have family in Germany too. And he said, okay, well, we'll bring them. Um, uh, so at that, uh, at, well, no, no, not at the family reunion, but after that, I met a wonderful guy named Bob Rosenwald, who has that Rosenwald look. Have you, you know Bob? Um, yeah, yeah. So he, his father was the one who went to Bill and Lessing and said, you know, things are bad in Germany. We want to leave. And um, he, they ended up living in North Dakota. And um, Bob grew up there um, with his incredibly Rosenwald face and uh, ended up working for the National Security Agency in Washington, DC. Uh, and I got to know him um, and then moved out to, to the Northern neck of Virginia where there was, guess what? A Rosenwald school that in 1932, when Julius died, they changed the name of it from the Northumberland County Training School. They changed it to Julius Rosenwald High School. And Bob worked hard to get, get the school um, preserved. Um, it's a wonderful story. Again, this would be a wonderful book for someone. Um, I can't do it, but um, <laughs> I'm running out of steam here, folks, and I don't speak German, but um, despite my name. Yeah. Who were the teachers? Yeah, early on, you know, after. Uh, well, it, in the Rosenwald program? Yeah. 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 Um, there was a woman named Anna Jeans who was um, a Quaker woman, and I can't remember where her fortune came from, but she had inherited a lot of money. And when she died, she left it to set up a fund that uh, was specifically to educate black teachers and to fund black teachers. And a lot of the teachers in Rosenwald schools were called Jeans teachers. So they were funded by this fund, they were black. Um, and they came to the schools. There were also Jeans supervisors who kind of kept an eye on all the schools in the district. And I talked to one woman um, at the Scrabble school um, who remembered that the Jeans, I mean, and you know, she would have been a child in the late 40s, early 50s. The Jeans supervisor would come sometime and bring her sewing machine and um, work with the work with the um, kids on sewing and things like that. So they were they were public school teachers, but there was a tremendous longevity. I mean, a lot of them stayed with one school for a long time. Um, another thing they did that I think was one of the reasons the relationships were so strong, since the schools were a lot of them in very rural areas, a lot of times the teacher lived with a family and would go home to whatever city or town 
on the weekends, but those relationships were really strong um, because they, they lived with the families. Uh, a question online, what efforts did Roosevelt take to hire black employees at Sears and to attract black customers? Mm, interesting question. Um, as I understand it, Rosenwald at some point raised the idea of hiring more blacks at Sears and there was some pushback and he decided, okay, I'm going to work, I'm going to work on this issue in a different way. Um, black customers, on the other hand, used the catalog a lot because, uh, you know, you didn't have to face discrimination. You could, you could, uh, oops, sorry. Um, uh, so there were a lot of black customers for the catalog. In fact, there were there were people who used to say that Rosenwald was black. You know, they, I mean, that that the pop, the magazine, the catalog was so popular, surely Mr. Rosenwald was black. Well, no, but um, yeah, that's an interesting question about the Sears thing. And again, that probably could use another look. Sounds like a lot of books. Um, yeah, somebody needs to be out there writing more books. Question in person or should I go? I have another Sears question. Yeah, uh, well, you spoke to this a moment ago, but I'm thinking about the financing of the ongoing school that you build a building, but then you need staff, they have to be paid, it has to be heated, the children need books and so forth. Where, where did the money come to operate these schools? Well, they were public schools. See, that was the genius of the program. They were public schools. So they were funded by far the largest funder of the exactly. school. Yeah, yeah, by far the largest funder of, for building the schools was the the state or the local jurisdiction, and they maintained the schools. Um, and, and the initial fundraising you talked about was on a matching basis that Rosenwald put in so much. And it wasn't always strictly matching, but there was always a contribution from the black community. Um, sometimes it was small. I mean, sometimes it was really small. Sometimes it was surprisingly large. But the community had to accept it because they were going to fund it on a ongoing basis, maybe. maybe not as well as other schools. But... You mean the community, the white community? Yeah, whoever was the tax base, the, the small yeah. public school, yeah. they had to realize you're going to have to put money into this. So. Yeah, and schools were such an undeniable part of, you know, the 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 state's responsibility. Um, Question online, did Sears provide some of the buildings prefab like the houses in their catalog? Very interesting question. Um, I love this anecdote or this story. Early on, Julius Rosenwald was notoriously thrifty. Um, you know, a man who knew the value of a dollar. And so he suggested early on, why don't we make the schools um, out of Sears prefabs. You all probably know you could buy a house from Sears. There were many, many, many different designs. And Sears suggested, uh, Julius suggested it would be cheaper and very efficient. And Booker T. Washington said, no. The whole thing of the program is we're going to have local craftsmen build the schools. We're going to have local people provide the materials. That's part of the community input. And I think one of Julius's strengths was um, he understood other people's, he, he was good at taking the, in, the advice and the ideas of other people. And he quickly backed off. So Sears provided the hardware and the paint and uh, Sears did provide some stuff, but not, but not prefab school, prefab houses. More questions in person. There's a whole class attending tonight's lectures from Tulane. They're studying education and diverse society. So they're oh good. Sure they're uh, that they're on through your research. Did you find modern parallels for Julius Rosenwald's dedication to social justice through education? Mm. That's an interesting question. Um, I'm sure there are modern parallels. I thought you were going to ask a question that I get asked frequently, which is what today um, mimics the impact and the, the, the positive environment of Rosenwald schools, which is a hard question to answer. Um, I have on occasion ventured into controversial territory by suggesting that charter schools, because they draw on the enthusiasm of parents and, and um, uh, often have a very dedicated parent base to some extent reflect 
what Rosenwald schools had, but um, it seems to me the more I think about it and the more I talk to alumni, the more I hear from them, the thing that these schools had was that very, very cohesive community supporting them. And the sense the children had of being part of something. And um, somehow our school systems don't have that or don't uniform, don't, don't have it everywhere. I'm sure they have it somewhere, some places, but our schools are bigger. And um, that, that connection, that deep connection between the community and the school has somehow been lost. That doesn't really answer the question, but. <laughs> We have any other questions in person, and then we'll, if we have one or two more questions in person, then we'll wrap up as well. So we have one, two, and then we'll say goodbye. I'm wondering um, how often the schools were mixed gender. Were they all, all of them? Involved? All of them. 100 percent. I want to make sure people understand there is a Rosenwald School in the Orleans Parish School System still. He's a, there. Yeah. Yeah, on the West Bank. And yeah, it's a charter school. Now it's a charter, charter school. It has survived all this time. The original building? No, the name. Just the name. They, they, kept, they kept the name Rosenwald in the Orleans Parish School System this whole time. So there's Wonderful. No Rosenwald school. Yeah. Which is, thanks for directing that out. There's also a community center on Earhart, which I'll show you later on. I bet my grandmother talked about it. So mm -hmm. show and of course, on Rhodes campus, there's the Oswald Hall of Experience. Yes. Yeah. What city? Sorry. What city on the West Bank? Now, here in New Orleans. Got it. It's Got it. Okay. So this there's is one more. One oh, more. Oh, there's oh, one more. Question. I'm sorry. Could you go back to that picture? And I mean, I didn't hear it or I missed it. What is the significance of this picture? Yeah. Um, when uh, Thurgood Marshall was putting together the briefs that led to the uh, separate but equal, the Brown versus Board of Education decision. One of the things he drew on was the work of two psychologists, Amy Phipps, I mean, not, Mamie Phipps Clark and Kenneth Clark. One of their experiments was called the doll experiment. They showed African-American children two dolls and asked them which one they wanted. And they almost always thought the white doll was better. And uh, this was used, um, they, speculated that the self-esteem of black children was being harmed by segregation and by the environment they were experiencing. And this picture is interesting, not just because it shows that experiment, but it was taken by uh, Gordon Parks, who was the recipient of um, a, a Rosenwald Fellowship uh, and was an amazing photographer. <laughs> it's a beautiful picture. Um, so I will shuffle to this side of the camera really fast um, and say thank you so much to Stephanie for this wonderful presentation and for being so giving with your time and your knowledge about Julius Rosenwald. Um, so thank you so much. Um, for us folks in person, um, more directions to come, book signing, there's some snacks in the other room. For us online, um, I hope you have good snacks at home or wherever you're at. Um, but this is just one of our many programs in our Rosenwald um, series uh, connected to our special exhibition. So if you're interested in learning more about Julius Rosenwald, I know I certainly am. Um, we have um, an upcoming uh, film um, this Sunday, Rosenwald, uh, the film by Aviva Kepner, and we'll have another screening in April. Um, very good. It's very good. We got an endorsement here in person. Um, on March 28th, uh, here at the museum and Zoomed online, we will be having um, some Rosenwald alumni come in and do oh. a panel, some lo local Louisiana folks. Um, so come on in. It's three Thursdays from today. Um, and our final our final program for the Rosenwald series um, will be a field trip to the Donaldsonville um, Reserved Rosenwald School, where we will be hearing from um, exhibit photographer Andrew Feiler and historians Jeannie Syriac and oh. Kathy Hambrick um, oh. as they discuss why they started preserving Rosenwald history. And as we think ahead past the exhibit here at MSJE, how we all can be involved in preserving Rosenwald history. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then um, un-Rosenwald related, next week at the museum, we will have our first um, 
event connected to the, uh, oh, I don't have that page, the Jewish and New Orleans Heritage and Food uh, Series. That's an ongoing series. It's Kugels and Collards um, with two um, uh, food historians and writers um, who will be here in person. So you don't want to miss that. Um, so thank you everybody in person and online for being here. Um, we appreciate you. If you have any information you want to send our way, you can contact us at the museum and follow us online and through our newsletter so you can know more about what's happening here. Thanks everybody and have a great rest of your night.